Welcome to Modern Aikidoist Podcast. Before we start, I want to thank everyone who has supported the show, and in particular those of you who have contributed to the PayPal tip jar. Of course, the likes, subscribes, and shares help a great deal as well. I enjoy bringing you this content, and the contributions help cover the expenses for doing so. I've had a wonderful time chatting with the people on these shows, so much so that I would like to have them back for further conversations. As you listen, if there are any questions or topics you would like to hear us discuss, please post up a note in the comments or send me them directly. I'll pick the best ones and we'll cover them in future episodes. Another way you can get more content is to join the Spirit Aikido online program. There are currently more than 120 videos in the program, with new ones being added every few days. Subscribers get access to video training and mentoring to techniques and training methods that I've adopted from other martial arts to make my Aikido more practical. In the most recent series of videos, I cover a number of kick defenses, and I also cover a weaponized version of Hijiotosh. There's a link to the program in the description. I invite you to check it out. Now, on with the discussion. I want to welcome Josh Gold. He uh, was generous enough to give me some of his precious time. I know how busy his schedule uh, seems to be. We've had a little bit of trick to get a time where we could we could both we both meet up. But uh, I'm very excited to have you on ha have you on the podcast and to chat a little bit about all the stuff that you've got got cooking over there. Thank you. It's a pleasure to join you today. Very nice. Uh, one of the things that uh, that of course most people are introduced to you through your inheritance of Aikido Journal and through Stanley Prannan's work. Uh, I really respect uh, Stanley Prannan's contributions to Aikido. It's almost immeasurable. He's just in so, has so many great articles and perspectives on Aikido. What's, what's it like to inherit somebody's such a strong legacy for, for his focus, which is probably a little different than yours? How do you view your perspective as being a little different and, uh, and how you take on inheriting his massive legacy sure so i guess the first part of that question how does it feel it it felt like a very heavy responsibility when uh when he first asked me to kind of be his successor or take on the take up the mantle of of aikido journal um it was something where i've been doing aikido since 1991 and aikido journal had had always been there it's like you know you you read it um it's sort of the um you know, it's sort of the, the one prominent or the, the largest uh, media publication in the Aikido world. And so um, to sort of have the responsibility to carry that forward, it, um, it was something that I, I had to think about very deeply and I, I saw it as a very significant undertaking and responsibility. Um, and it ended up the, you know, the first part of that, the, you know, the transition after he passed away, it was, it was quite tough. And um, he was very he was very sick uh, near the end, and and I went out and he lived in Las Vegas, and I'm in Southern California, and I drove out a number of times to to visit with him, and um, he mentored me, he shared information with me, he um, you know walked me through a lot of the old materials and the research that he had done, um, you know, but it was tough to to see him in that in that state, and then after he passed away, it was exceedingly difficult because while he was an amazing historian and researcher, um, technology wasn't his strong suit. And so <clears throat> there were a bunch of databases that we had trouble getting access to. I mean, we almost lost whatever, 30 years worth of research materials and things like that, that were all, all digitized. Um, and fortunately there were a few heroes who had worked with Stanley in the past that, that kind of came to the rescue and were able to unlock that stuff. Um, so yeah, I saw it as a very, very heavy responsibility and also a great honor um, to, to carry that forward. And I've just tried to do the, the best that I, I could since, since that time. Um, and I guess in terms of perspective, that was the, the, the second part of the question you, mm -hmm. you yeah, asked. Yeah, obviously your path in Aikido was a certain way and then this would seem to invite diverting it almost to, to because it requires so much attention did it did it affect your perspective and your your path well it did affect my path i mean i was in a position where um i'm running ikazuchi dojo out in southern california mm -hmm. we have a whole bunch of initiatives going on and um in addition to the you know kind of standard traditional 
dojo training that um, that exists most places. So it wasn't like I was looking for other things to occupy my time. So it was a um, it was a it was a decision that I I didn't take lightly, and I, I really thought you know thought through it carefully. And and so yeah, it did it it changed kind of how I changed my focus a little bit, uh, but I think in a in a positive way. And through that, I've I've learned so much and I feel as though I've made so many new friends and um, connected with so many mentors in the Aikido and broader martial arts community that um, I'm just so thankful for that. It's, it's really been fantastic. But um, yeah, our, my perspective and Stanley Prannan's perspective are a little bit, a little bit different. And you, know, you may have seen that in terms of the shift of, of the publication, the focus of it. Um, Stanley was a historian and he, he had a, a, a passion to really research and uncover the history of Aikido and its founder and to be able to document that and, and tell the story of, of that, uh, the birth of Aikido and, and you know, how, it, how it evolved over time. And um, he spoke fluent Japanese and I think like six other languages uh, as well. I, I mean, he, is amazing. Like I was going through the archives and I would see videos of him <clears throat> translating for Saito Sensei mm -hmm. and Saito Sensei speaking in Japanese. And then Stan, who's an American native English speaker is then translating into Italian for people. And then somebody would ask a question like French and then he would respond in French. And it's just, it was amazing. So anyway, he was a, he was a historian um, and I am not so I'm not a historian and I don't, I don't speak fluent Japanese and, and I don't have that, that depth of um, historical knowledge in the, in the Aikido world. So um, I, can't, I can't do that. You know, I have to have a little bit of a different focus. And um, uh, for me, I think I can look back at Stanley's legacy and I think that largely in a way it's, you know, his mission was complete, right? And of course there, there's, there's always new things to research, right? Uh, in terms of the, you know, the history of, of Aikido, its relationship to other, other art forms and, and all this stuff. Um, but I think he did a fantastic job of documenting that stuff and telling that story. And so moving forward, I just have to figure out how to, um, how to make Aikido Journal the best version of it, you know, that I can make it with my, with my skills, with my background, my abilities. And so I try to focus a little bit more on what's happening today, like in the present time. And then, you know, looking towards the future a little bit too, in terms of what, um, how things might evolve into the future, what new ideas are coming up or what new initiatives are being undertaken that are kind of interesting that people may benefit from. What can we do to, unify and strengthen the the Aikido community and make ourselves better um, better practitioners, better teachers and better members of our society. And so that's that's kind of my my focus with Aikido sure. Journal. It seems like like Prennan was at a time in history where he had the opportunity to interview a lot of people who are now passed away like that window is no longer open. And it was great to see some of the perspective that he offered, especially being that he t t uh, seemed to approach it as kind of like an atheist. Like he he just wanted to say, here's a, actually what happened without the distortions of agendas or politics or things like that, which is kind of refreshing, it was very refreshing in that we see as time goes on, people's motives and whatnot will often come into play where these distortions get greater and greater and greater without that that anchor of here's what the actual person you're talking about said or things that actually happened. So, um, you know, it's really great, firstly, that he did it uh, and was able to continue doing it despite, you know, some of the articles that, and things that he brought up, I think were probably a little sensitive. Uh, people would rather have some of those things just forgotten about. Um, not only that he did it, but also that it did not, all that information that he gathered didn't just die out or disappear. Like, I, I think those are really important things for the, for Aikido to have is to, uh, is a real dose of the history of it, not just the, what we all believe the history to be, which shifts and changes over time. I think that's right. And I think that <clears throat> Stanley did a fantastic job of really documenting 
things well. So when he would talk about the history of Aikido, he, you know, he would list the sources, he would cite the sources and he would provide historical documents and things like this to, to back it all up. So, uh, yes, I, I feel as though he really did research that, that stuff, uh, rigorously and in publishing it. Yes. I think he stepped on some toes. He ruffled some feathers. Um, and there were a lot of people who were not happy with that. And, I don't think that Stan ever had the intention of offending anybody, um, but I think he really strongly felt that he wanted the world to have a an accurate historical snapshot, sort of 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 you know of, of Aikido. And I will tell you this: that um, some of the things that Stan published, I know, may have like I said, offended people or perhaps embarrassed people in certain ways or, you know, these sorts of things. But for every one of those things, there are hundreds of things that Stan did not disclose um, in the initial interviews and research because he felt that these are things that are either they're private things and it doesn't serve any purpose to sort of like air, you know, air right. these things there. Because if you look at, at Aikido in, in, you know, the history from its inception forward, there are so many people involved and every human being is flawed, right? In, in different ways. We all are, exactly. And, you know, Stan didn't have any intention of being malicious. And I think that, um, um, yeah, but, but he did feel very strongly that it was important to kind of get the, you know, the historical facts out there, so. Yeah, and with accuracy, I always relate that to the word truth. And, and if something is true, you should never be ashamed of of having it be known in fact really the only shame is when you embrace a lie or a falsehood or you try to put portray yourself as something you're not or you try to portray somebody else as something that they're not like that's something to be ashamed of and yeah we all have our flaws we've all made our mistakes and you know airing dirty laundry is certainly not not a good thing to do but when it comes to ourselves we improve when we isolate and, and find a flaw within ourselves, or something that's wrong or, or the, uh, a lie that we embrace and we purge it, we get rid of it. And, and I think that that's a part of the process of martial arts training in general is we're trying to find the deficiency, find the flaws, find the falsehoods that we think are true and we're embracing them anyway, <laughs> and then get rid of them to say, I realize this is not right and it needs to be fixed. And you put your ego aside and you say, yeah, I believe this for a long time, but I need to let go. I need to let go and embrace what's what the truth is. Uh, and that actually brings me to the to the next topic. And, and this is a letter. I remember reading this letter or the article that you wrote a number of years ago about your experiment with the knife defenses with Jeff Imada. And boy, when I read that article, it landed so squarely with me because I had the exact same experience with, and I call it my, my first crisis of faith with Aikido. When I met some uh, mentors, uh, they came to be mentors of mine, that we went into the knife defense stuff deep because they did the exact same thing and said, you know what, this stuff is just nonsense. And they didn't come from an Aikido world. They came from other martial arts and whatnot. And Aikido is not the only one, but when I, when I compared what I was taught in Aikido for knife defenses and we put it to a, a, a live, even slow moving person with a knife, they just all crumbled and they just, it, I just had to walk away and say, you know what, this needs to be torn down and rebuilt. It's like a, a rickety house. <laughs> you can't, you can't patch it. You just need to, to, to restack. And then there's a few co concepts in there that I kept, but that article really hit hit me. And I wanted to ask you about what the aftermath of that was. Did, did you feel like the Aikido community embraced that experiment? Or do you feel like you got some backlash from it? Like, how dare you go outside the, the ideology that we've agreed upon? Yeah, I think in terms of aftermath, I certainly did get a a little bit of backlash, but not that much. I, I, you know, some people would contact me and they would say, well, you know, you could have made it work if you put key into the, you know, into sure. the Kotagaishi throw, or you could have, you know, done an It's not the or art's whatever. fault, it's your fault. They try to kind of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I, I did get a little bit of that. Mm -hmm. um, and I also got a little bit of why are you, you know, why are you showcasing our art in a bad light? Like, why don't you showcase 
you know, the good things about it as opposed to the, you know, the flaws. And sure. so there's a little bit of that. Um, and, but more than anything, I would say I made a ton of friends through this and, and actually the, you know, the ratio of positive feedback to negative, you, you know, wasn't even close. I got way more positive feedback from, from people sure. and people contacted me from within the Aikido community, from within the Kali community, from Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, like all over the place and said, Hey, um, I really appreciate you kind of, you know, sharing this as a collaboration and it's really cool to see. And I learned some stuff from this and, um, it makes me think a little bit more about, um, you know, about knife defenses and, and what we're doing. And I think if you look at a lot of art forms, you know, Aikido, it's not primarily like a, a knife defense art. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that you you would find similar weaknesses in a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu system or anything like that uh, when you're sure. when you're dealing with knife defenses. And mm -hmm. I think that, you know, the, the knife or the Tanto techniques that we do in Aikido, um, I think they're designed to supplement or augment the empty-handed training right they're like we, we use the knife as a as an extension tool <clears throat> excuse me um that allows us to practice the you know the techniques and the principles of of the art um but i do think it's a mistake to think of those techniques as like okay I, I, these are the best things for me to use if somebody's actually attacking me with a knife mm -hmm. and so i think a lot of it is just context it's like if you you know if you understand what the movements um you know, are in the Aikido system and you don't have any delusions about that and you, you know, you benefit from, from practicing in that, in that modality, um, that's great. Um, and if you want to learn, you know, more, let's say sophisticated or rigorous kind of like knife, you know, knife defense or knife fighting stuff, you know, there, there are other venues for, for doing that. And I, I, I think more than anything, the problem occurs is when uh, people don't understand exactly what what they're doing and they think that the you know they think that those basic aikido knife takeaways and defenses will work um against a sophisticated person wielding a knife right or even just an intent one not even so yes. sophisticated but yeah you know right. it, and i i'm really glad to hear that especially because the, the I'm, I'm always concerned when when you have i guess the aikido acolytes who will say how dare you threaten my religion by by bringing a, a dose of reality to it or a dose of somebody else's truth a knife fighter's truth uh and as you describe the positive um feedback that you got that it was overwhelmingly positive to me that is a testament to the the connection the principle of connection that with aikido like the more that that we as practitioners branch out and work with other martial artists other martial arts uh, the better off our Aikido is going to be, and it's going to benefit from that connection, not so much isolating ourselves and saying, we're just going to do our own thing over here and what everybody else is doing. We don't want to have any interest in that. Um, and I think it would go both directions, you know, with the cross training that I've done and, and some of the people that I've trained with, they all not only get benefit from training outside, they also give a benefit to Aikido by sharing with what we do to those arts. I have yet to experience getting together with any other senior martial artist and not have them walk away and say, wow, there's more to this Aikido thing than I really appreciated. Like what you guys can do is, is remarkable. And, and, and to me though, that's the kind of community that the role that Aikido should have in the martial arts community, not to be the lone, the black sheep that's out doing its own thing, but you know, gathered together with, with other practitioners. Yeah, I, I, I fully agree with that. And I, I think that, at least for me, my personal experience is that when I interact with other martial artists from other disciplines, if I'm sort of honest with myself about what Aikido is and what its strengths are and what its weaknesses are and, and what it's about, um, when I share that with other martial artists, they, they love it. You know, they love Aikido. And I've, I've interacted with, um, of course, expert Kali practitioners uh, like Jeff Imada or his, you know, his teacher Dan Inosanto, mm -hmm. um, or uh, Dr. Mark Chang. Uh, so any any of these people, and they they all love Aikido, um, and they they actively learn Aikido. They want to learn Aikido, uh, or even it could be somebody who's an Olympic level wrestler, wrestler or a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu person. And so uh, 
at least in my experience, everybody's been very welcoming and they, they respect Aikido uh, as an art form for what it is. And they, a lot of them really, really love it. Um, and so I think, you know, the less insular we are and the more we can kind of embrace our brothers and sisters in the larger martial arts community, um, the more friendships we can develop, the more we can kind of promote Aikido in a, in a positive way. And the more I feel like we can learn what, what our art is about and what, you know, what the place of Aikido is in the larger martial arts ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really, really important because there's no martial art that's, you know, sort of like the best or it's perfect or whatever. And there, there are all these different art forms and they're all elegant and beautiful in their own way. And, and they all have kind of a, a specific focus or a, or a purpose. And so for me, through cross training and building friendships with practitioners of other art forms, it, it makes me appreciate Aikido for what it is even more. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and when I've talked with, uh, with other instructors and senior practitioners, I'll always ask them like, you know, what do you think of Aikido or, or have you had any exposure to it? And I, I get mostly one response and one is, I see what Aikido is when I look around at things like videos and its reputation and stuff, which is pretty bad, to be honest. They said, then I ran into, I ran into somebody. I ran into one person that really knew what they were doing and wow, what, what they could do was amazing. And, and that was an overwhelming um, response. Like there's a lot of respect among people that have gone past just looking either at movies or looking at, you know, some of the ridiculous criticisms and, and um, even some of the, the, the things that Aikido people will put up that look pretty foolish. You know, we got to admit that that's <laughs> part of a part of Aikido's reputation problem is self uh, inflicted. It's not entirely from the outside, but I would say it's mostly self inflicted. I, yeah, I, I agree. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Uh, but I did have one and, and I, I met this guy and we were doing a, a kind of a martial instructors and martial artists meetup sort of thing where you'd all get on the mat together, people of all kinds of different backgrounds. And, and he and I got to talking one day and he said, you know, I never really thought much of Aikido. And um, said, but I, now that I've worked with you, I, I really have a lot of respect for it. Like I, it's efficiency and it's motion and, and uh, how direct and, and effective it is. He says, I, I really have to give it to you. I have to give Aikido another shake. I, I, and that was really a profound thing for me to hear because like we're all ambassadors of the art, whether or not, you know, you're famous, somebody like you, who's got, you know, a lot of eyes on you, but even an individual person, you know, maybe you're, you know, brown, brown belt or, or something like that in a dojo and you meet another martial artist and he goes, you do Aikido, you know, show me something or how, how does it work? You know, give me a little sample of it. We're all ambassadors that way. And, um, you know, I, I think, it saddens me when I see seniors, especially instructors and high level instructors, kind of bad mouth Aikido by saying, well, it's it was never meant to be used for self-defense. It was never meant to, to be an effective martial art or, or useful in a fight or anything like that, because basically they're just justifying why it should suck and be, be useful and not practical. Um, and I don't think that Osensei or any of his primary students or, or people that were studying very intently back in the, you know, 40s, 50s, all the way through would agree with that. What, what do you think of that? Well, I think, you know, the idea of effectiveness is so context dependent. Um, for example, I, I think you did a a conversation a little while ago with uh, Bruce Bookman mm -hmm. and uh, Ellis Amder senseis, right? Yep, yep. And um, I believe it might've been Ellis who he may have even mentioned on your podcast mm -hmm. uh, that, okay, imagine you have an Aikido practitioner that's done a lot of randori where they have dealt with multiple attackers and they understand tactical positioning um, and distancing and facing and all these things. And, and now take that person and put them in a situation where maybe they end up in like a, you know, in the middle of a freaking riot or civil unrest and they have sure. to get from point A to point B safely. That Aikido practitioner is gonna be far better trained to do that than say an MMA fighter would. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I even saw, I saw a video where I think it was a couple MMA fighters went to the Marine Martial Arts Academy to get some training. And one of the exercises they had them do is they said, okay, you guys have to get 
they took them outside and they said, you have to get from point A to point B, which is maybe 300 yards away through a forest or something like that mm -hmm. and, and not get killed by the, you know, by the, the Marines that were hiding in the woods. Yeah, exactly. Right. I remember that. And so, and, and, um, and these MMA fighters made critical errors where when they would see one of the Marines emerge from behind um, cover, they would basically charge that person and engage them and ignore the other Marines who would just come up right behind them and then you're right, stab right. them with a yep. play bayonet in the back or whatever, right? So, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and on the flip side, if you take an Aikido practitioner who has, who has rarely or maybe never dealt with a fully resisting, you know, kind of like sparring partner, if you put them in an MMA ring, you know, mm -hmm they're going to fail for sure. Right. So I think that, you know, Aikido is a form of Budo and, um, you know, I think Aikido is probably optimized more as a personal development or a um, educational system as opposed to like a hand-to-hand -hand combat system. But the techniques that are in the Aikido system are these legit powerful techniques that you see in you see them in jujitsu. You see them used in in MMA. You see them used in Krav Maga, like just you know, slight has, has a number catch. of them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so all these techniques are like real, legit, powerful martial techniques uh, that can be applied in devastating ways if you you know if you have the the expertise to do so. And a lot of O Sensei's first generation students were already veteran martial artists, mm -hmm. right? That you know, that, that had experience in judo or karate or, or whatever. Sumo. And they were able to, yeah, sumo, exactly. And they, they could, they could synthesize the stuff and put it all together. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think, um, the martial effectiveness of Aikido, it's something where I think it has, to, you know, there has to be that level of martiality there, um, that can manifest itself in effective ways from a self-defense perspective. Mm -hmm. Um, but even if you don't care about the self-defense, I think that having that you know, that martiality is necessary, even for it to work as a personal development system. Right. Um, so I think it's important that it's, you know, that it, that it's there, but at the same time, I think it's important to understand like the context of, you know, of the application of the skills that you're developing. And if you, you know, if you do want to go into an MMA ring, or if you want to get really good at being able to defend yourself against, I don't know, somebody, throwing punches at you in an alley then you probably want to do some kind of cross training of some right. form mm -hmm. yeah yeah you know i mean people often view violence as being a monolithic thing but it really isn't it, it changes whether you're in you know on the streets of mogadishu as a soldier versus whether you're you know walking home from a walking to your car for, you know from a grocery store and you get mugged versus uh being in a in a fight ring you know like a prize fighter all of those realms are very, very different. In fact, my opinion is that Aikido is probably best suited for that civilian application. Like if you want to learn to be a Marine fighter, that, that, that those skills, as much as I respect the Marine martial art, and it really is well flushed out and is potent for their application, does not fit. Like, for example, you're a, you're a nurse or an orderly in a hospital, and you get somebody that is starting to, to throw punches at you. Like that's not a good match there. Or like, let's say a, a high school wrestler or something like that. But I think that's that right. Aikido does, does a good job at treating that, that level of civilian violence and addressing it where it might not be somebody is going absolute to level 10 intensity and trying to rip your head off. They may be just grabbing you, trying to get the keys out of your pocket, or they might be just trying to, you know, push you or push you around or something of that nature. So, um, you know, I think people that that use that look at violence as a very simple thing. It's not a simple thing. It's a very complex, very intricate, chaotic um, swirl of of things that could be going on. And and I think just like you said, it, there's a number of MMA fighters that have been beaten up in street fights because they don't see somebody behind them. They're not used to, to, to being approached from behind because they have a ring there to make sure that they never do that. Um, and so I, I do think Aikido has got a great niche for that would appeal to most people that just want to learn to defend themselves. They don't want to learn to be a professional fighter. They don't want to be a soldier out on a battlefield. They just want to be able to go about their way, not be controlled, not be 
uh, pushed around, or if they are attacked, they have the ability to, you know, neutralize it to the point where they can get away without having to, to, you know, kill or hurt somebody in order to do it. I think that's right. And I teach, um, when we're not in the middle of a pandemic, I teach um, Aikido on the campus of Blizzard Entertainment, okay. Activision Blizzard. It's one of the world's largest video game companies. And I also do um, like some self-defense workshops there for folks. Mm -hmm. And when we do the self-defense workshops, it's not pure Aikido. So we teach a lot of, you know, grab release stuff and, you know, knee strikes or whatever. But the thing that, that precedes any kind of physical training is a discussion about, about self-defense and violence and things like this. And there was, one of the things that I talk about is there was a study done in the 1980s, I think. And what they did is they went into a, a high security prison and they interviewed maybe a hundred felons who had been convicted of um, assault, you know, murder, rape, like, you know, where you're basically attacking another, another person. And what they would do is they would show these people videos of, of street scenes, people walking down the street, and they would say, okay, select who's going to be your, your target, who are you going to go after? And um, <clears throat> they ended up calling it like the seven second rule where these, most of these people would be able to identify who they were going to uh, assault or attack within seven seconds. Mm -hmm. And it really had nothing to do with age. It had nothing to do with gender or actual like physical strength or size. The, the things that they looked at were posture. Mm -hmm. Does the person have like a good balanced posture or are they kind of like hunched over like this? Mm -hmm. um, what is their gait what does their walk cycle look like do they walk in a balanced and confident way or are they kind of shuffling or stumbling around and then the third thing is just uh situational awareness right are they you know this was before people had mobile phones but kind of like are they are they looking at the ground or are they looking at their surroundings are they alert right do they see what's going on around them yeah. are they paying attention and these are the three things um that would either kind of like encourage or dissuade people from choosing a target to, to attack. And I think before you ever get to a situation where somebody's swinging a fist at you or whatever, um, Aikido is excellent in these regards because it teaches you posture. It teaches you how to walk with balance and confidence and how to have that kind of martial presence, if you will, and to be aware of your surroundings in all directions. And so I think from a self-defense perspective, even just that piece is a no-brainer, right? To sure. be able to to cultivate that through through Aikido. And like you said, you know, kind of the idea of, okay, there are all these situations that are not black and white where it's, it's like, okay, we're not, you know, it, it's not a death match or a situation where somebody necessarily is trying to, to terminate you. Maybe somebody's trying to pull the keys out of your hand or, you know, you get, you know, somebody in a bar who shoves you or whatever. And um, I think for these kinds of things, Aikido can be very valuable. You know, I, I'm glad you mentioned that study. I remember reading about that years ago. In fact, I met a retired uh, chief of police that did uh, took it on himself to interview criminals about their process and how they study their target and what they're looking for, not only from the initial assessment part, which he, his experience was exactly like what you described, but also the process. Now they've chosen the target, how do they approach them? And, and they, can all, they can decide to avert their attack all the way up to and through the interview just to, to kind of feel them out. It's like an intelligence gathering uh, situation. But, you know, I've being a taken my own study into the self-defense thing. I've seen many articles that talk about, well, you shouldn't, if you're a woman, you shouldn't have long hair because they'll, they'll go and they'll study the number of women that have been attacked. And they'll say like 80% of them have long hair. So don't have long hair. You should have short hair or don't put it in a ponytail all of the, or, or blonde, if you're blonde, the, the, your, your chances of getting attacked go up because the studies show that the, of the victims, you know, they kind of profile them that way. But I like studies that, that like the, the officer I talked with and the, the study that you mentioned, because that didn't enter into the consideration at all. I don't think that, that the correlation led to the causation. I think it was the reverse. It just so happened that, you know, most women had long hair. So the odds of, being attacked because you had long hair were, was more coincidental than it was an influence of why that person was chosen. But, and I do think the cell phone was probably the biggest gift to street thugs and criminals ever 
because you could walk right up to somebody and they're staring down at their phone. They have no idea what's going on around them. And then you add in when they listen to headphones, they, you could stomp up, you know, ringing a bell behind them and they would never know that you're coming up on them. And so I think these are some good, uh, good things to consider from a self-defense angle. And I agree with you, I, you know, posture and athleticism and in what being able to walk confidently does usually put, uh, put you off of the prey list. Um, so I think yeah. it's a, yeah, it is good practice. And I think also, you know, for those who are interested in self-defense, the, you know, Aikido can temper you in a martial way and Aikido can give you that presence um, that will make you a less appealing target. Mm -hmm. But there are all kinds of ways you can, you can supplement that. And there are all these uh, dimensions to self-defense that people don't really think about. Uh, for example, do you even know the self-defense laws in your area, right? Mm -hmm. um, or verbal de-escalation. Mm -hmm. If there's somebody in front of you who's enraged, can you tell the difference between somebody who is actually in a, you know, in a state of rage versus uh, maybe they're just sort of like slightly pissed off? And then how do you, how can you verbally de-escalate that or exit the situation in a, you know, in a way that that it doesn't end up in like a, a physical interaction? Sure. Um, so anyway, like all these are things that, you know, that can be, that can and probably should be studied um, for those who are interested in this, in this area. And uh, just to mention Bruce Bookman sensei, again, my daughter, who is now 19, I actually flew her up to Seattle. Uh, I think it was maybe two years ago to participate in one of Bruce Bookman sensei's. He, he um, and a couple other folks have collaborated and developed kind of like this women's self-defense intensive. Mm -hmm. That's like a full day thing. Um, and, you know, the kind of observational skills and the kinds of verbal de-escalation skills and the ability to set boundaries at different, you know, sort of like different, even distance, right? Dis mm -hmm. Distances. Um, and then, okay, when the person closes this distance or they close this distance, now you need, you, you know, now you know they really mean you harm and now you just have to, right. you know, go all out or whatever. So those kinds of supplementary training systems, I think, you know, are very, very valuable for anybody who's interested in, in self-defense. Yeah. And I mean, it, we all have our own view of what Aikido is and what we want Aikido to be to ourselves. For me, part of it is the strategy. I really like its approach for that strategy. And what you describe in there de-escalation is a strategy. Being able to move past somebody to get out the door, that's a strategy. Having the tools, which are the techniques, in order to employ that strategy, that's how they kind of fit together. And yes. you know, it's nice to have the physical confidence, but just learning the tools alone do not cover the strategy. It needs to be taught like you describe of, all right, here's the situation. Here's what I need to sort out. You know, Can you read your potential attacker? Can you read the situation? Do you know, you know how to take into account the person that's with you that's, you know, you need to get them out. You need to protect them as well as protect yourself. This is such a, uh, such a big rabbit hole to go down of, you know, how to keep all these things in order and having the physical tools is certainly a, plays a huge role in that strategy. Um, you know, but it's not, it's not everything. And I think a lot of people that, that view Aikido or argue about what Aikido is or isn't tend to come down to, it's just a, this batch of techniques. And to me, the techniques are just a little part of a bigger thing and being able to like it, like you described, a, let's say you got to get through a crowd in a riot, or you got to deal with several people, like you need the glue that holds those techniques together. The techniques alone is not going to do it for you. And that's where the, how, how, to me, training and how you take your training on will either glue those techniques together into something cohesive that can be practical, or you're just going to think, well, what technique do I need to use? And then you just get overwhelmed. Right, right. And I think by technique, you know, it could be, we could be talking about kotagaishi or it could be um, a verbal de-escalation technique, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Yeah. Or a simple offline shift and a push and, and off you go. Yeah. It could be just yeah. that that easy um yeah absolutely so um i i think that and this is one thing i noticed in just in seeing videos of, of you know aikido around that focusing just on the minutiae of technique is it's almost too hyper focused yes there's a time to really hone 
can you do your technique really well, really solid? You know, you always want to improve it, absolutely. But putting it in, a, in that context of, can you deal with kind of the chaos? And can you, uh, uh, can you abide by the principles when you're not in that strict paired kata formula, but you have other influences going on? And that's why I like Giawazas and Randori's so much. Um, you know, I've taken my students into the changing room, into the, into the hallway, like this is the sort of space that you're probably gonna encounter if you get attacked. Like you might be in a stairwell, you know, you get out on the mat and you got all this room in the world and you're, you know, you can move around, but you get into a little office or something and now your space is limited. So all these things tend to open up the mind, I think, and develop that part of how do we bring the, the techniques together into a strategy uh, for when, you know, the reality hits. Right, right. Very cool. Um, all right, well, let's get to the next one. And, and I'm really curious, and I, I, I kind of broke this up with, with uh, Larry Reynoso when I talked with him in that I wanted to talk a little about your views on the future of Aikido. And I know that the virus thing and the lockdowns have got a, are casting a huge shadow over the future of all martial arts. But I kind of wanted to get your view on where you see Aikido going in the next 10, 20 years. Like, what are you seeing as trends? And maybe do it kind of without the virus thing, like where, where it would be going on its own without that. Um, and then maybe you can cover a little bit of, you know, how maybe how Aikido can grow or continue on should we wind up being in this absurd situation of not being able to train. Sure. Okay, well, in, in terms of the future of Aikido, I think um, I can only share my perspective and everybody has different ideas here. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that if we just look at the art form itself, I think it's something that is, it can potentially have very broad appeal. And it's something that people love to do. I mean, I've, I've practiced this continuously for almost 30 years. And how long have you been practicing Aikido? I started in originally in the late 90s, uh, very temporarily, but seriously in 2004. So about 16 years now. 16 years, long time. So and the, still love it to death. I just, I adore it. Yeah. So I think it's an amazing martial art. It's a great system. And I think that it can benefit people in so many ways. I think, of course, there's, you know, there are the physical benefits that, that come from it in terms of developing proper posture, in terms of stimulating the joints in ways that in modern society, people typically don't, you know, don't do. Um, even kind of changing orientation by taking ukemi, this stimulates the vestibular system in ways that most people, most adults, they never, you know, they never get exposed to that kind of thing because they're sitting at a computer upright all the time. They're, they're never in an inverted position or changing levels or, or any of these things. So, um, you know, you have that, you have the community aspect of, of, of the art form. You, you know, you have um, the ability for it to, to really push people to learn about themselves and to develop themselves almost to forge their, you know, their personalities, right? In a certain way, you can test your will, you can test your ability to persevere, you can test your ability to yield, right? Mm -hmm. um, to be able to get along with somebody who maybe you don't like necessarily, but you still have to work with them on the mat um, and, and find a constructive way forward. Uh, so I, I think, and it's, it's also, it's an amazing way to just relate to another human being is through the practice of, of Aikido. Mm -hmm. And uh, when lockdown hit, you know, we closed our dojo and I wasn't really able to practice for me. And that was, you know, that was very crippling for me um, in, in many ways, like emotionally to, to, not, to not be able to, to do that practice. And my wife who's done yoga for over a decade, she's like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna train with you. And so she, she came in, we got on the mat and I started practicing with her. And, um, you know, not only was it good for me in terms of, of being able to kind of get back to that, you know, that practice, mm -hmm. but um, I was able to like relate to her and learn about her in a way that I, you know, it's like a side that I'd never seen before. Mm -hmm. uh, of her, even though she's my she's my wife. So mm -hmm. I think even that the the way that you relate to people through the practice of Aikido, it's it's something that's you know that's it's beautiful and unique and and it and it's so special. So I think that I mean I could go on and on and on about all the you know the benefits of of Aikido. And so I think that there is a place for Aikido in society moving yeah. forward, an important place. And I think Aikido now is really an undervalued societal asset. 
um, especially in today's digital world where people are isolated in these silos or on digital devices all the time. Um, you know, human connection is something which is more limited than it has been in, in the past. And even our ability to interact with different kinds of people um, has become more and more limited where when you're on social media, you know, you, you basically, you get filtered into these silos with people who are just like you. And then when you work in an office, usually it's people who are in a similar socioeconomic background, mm -hmm. right? Um, as you and probably similar age and education level and all this stuff. And in a dojo, in an Aikido dojo, you know, you interact with people from all different walks of life, all different backgrounds um, in a way that I think can benefit everybody. So I think that the future of Aikido can be bright if we position it in the right way, if we're honest with ourselves and with other people about what Aikido is, what the benefits of it are, um, and we're able to share it in a way that, um, where we can really communicate this stuff that shows our enthusiasm for what it is, and we can explain it in a clear, in a clear way. You know, something that, that I haven't heard too many people uh, talk about, but I've certainly noticed, and that is that the, the mat is, is like truth there. And one of the, the problems I, I see with social media in general is that it's easy to get a distorted view of what somebody else is just by a little blurb they type or, or something and you read it wrong. And on the mat though, you cannot hide yourself. And when, when people come in, I'll usually, you know, they start training and, and whatnot. And, and I'll tell them like, you're gonna see a part of yourself that you've probably never seen before here on the mat. And if there's, it's personal when you get on, on the mat because you're, you're developing yourself, but you're also, ha you will show what you are like underneath. And I like being on the mat because somebody can lie to me, lie to my face and they get on the mat and I'll see exactly what they really are. Um, and I used to do a full contact competition and I, I found the same thing there too. It's like somebody can, can speak the nicest, smoothest words, but if we go out and actually fight, I'm going to see exactly what you're about. I, I can tell if somebody is honorable, if they have integrity, if they are generous, and I can see if they are ruthless and harsh and brutal. You, you can't hide it and it doesn't require, you know, you, you can't lie through that. And, and that's why I, one of the beauties I like of the mat is that we are sharing a genuine side of ourselves and we, we're putting ourselves out there in the fact that we do want to find our flaws and try to hammer through them and try to eliminate them as, much, as best as we can. But it, it does not conducive to that distortion that happens on social media, or even if you meet somebody casually and they, they kind of feed you a line, they try to make themselves out to be something they're not. And you, you believe them because you take them at face value. And only maybe later do you find out, well, wait a second, this is, this is a person's totally different than how they portrayed themselves. And, and I, I like the mat for the fact that it, it tends to remove those distortions and it does it very quickly. Uh, somebody who's a liar or deceitful or who has uh, some serious character flaws, it's very difficult to maintain that for long on the mat. You'll find, you'll find out what their real character is like. And, and I think if anything, these days, people will, will find that they like that genuine uh, contact and knowing what people are about. Um, you know, in addition to the, the self-development, eh, some people just don't want to develop themselves. That's, that's kind of sad, but you know, for a lot of those people that do, uh, I think Aikido is a, in any martial art really, the, under a good instructor is going to bring that out in you. There's going to be that honesty. I think that's right. And that's a really good point, which is that a lot of the things that we were just talking about, it's not exclusive to Aikido. You can, no, you absolutely. know, you can find, find these benefits in Brazilian jiu-jitsu or wrestling or, you know, taekwondo, any of these art forms. It's just, you know, you have different expressions and different martial arts will suit different people, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. But yeah, I think that that's a huge thing. And the, I think that if you look at self-defense and we talk about self-defense mm -hmm. um, in the context of, of learning martial arts and how this, um, what's the relevance of this in today's society? Mm -hmm. In most, um, in most advanced countries, they're, they're safer than ever, right? Physically, 
the, like kids today in, in the United States are physically safer than any prior generation. Um, and so it's kind of interesting. So from the self-defense perspective, um, you know, the martial arts are probably less necessary in, in most places um, than they ever were. But I think you have to have that martiality. You have to have that sense of danger and that authentic interaction with another human being where there is this physical and emotional and psychological tension, right? And a real threat there for you to really get the benefit from the martial arts. And it's something that when you feel that, I think it's something that, I don't know, it's probably encoded into human DNA at some very, very deep level, right? And, and once you kind of feel that um, in the context of a, of a dojo where you're learning in a positive environment and all that stuff, um, it's just such a powerful thing. And I think it's something that can benefit so, so many people um, in so many ways. Well, yeah, and it winds up being kind of a, a, an inoculation of danger by taking, you know, little doses in the dojo where you're, you get a little bit more, you, you're taking a little outside your comfort zone, but not so much that you're totally overwhelmed, but you start getting inoculated to it and you start realizing that as your capabilities build, you can handle more and more and more. And that's where your true confidence comes from. And, you know, a wise martial artist will know that he's not invincible that there's certainly situations that he cannot prevail in, but you also realize when, when you're getting there or when there, you're in a situation like, I know I can handle this. And that's where, to me, the spiritual calm comes from, the mental calm. You People get angry and agitated when they are so fearful that they are gonna be overwhelmed. And if, the, if they're in a situation that's pretty mild in comparison, but they're so frightened, they're going to respond like a frightened animal. Whereas if they're confident and calm, the very same situation that would have somebody with no experience, they would start to get hysterical. They can remain calm, keep their strategy, figure out how they're gonna get that harmony back and, and how little they're gonna need to do to do it. Like to me, that's the, that's the beauty of the strategy of Aikido and how it fits together with the physical part. It's like the physical and mental are very much intertwined. Yes, agreed, agreed. So yeah. I think that there, I really do think that there, we have the potential to create a very bright future for, for Aikido. Um, and there are many ways, you know, there are many paths to follow and there are many roles to play, right? So, you know, Definitely. for some people, you know, for some people just focus on quality, like, you know, just focus on preserving and transmitting like the core traditional Aikido techniques and, and, you know, and philosophy. And for other people, there's an opportunity to do um, other more progressive or innovative things, I think. And, you know, there, there, there's room for all of these, you know, all of these different expressions of, sure. of the art. Uh, and I think if we, you know, if at least some of us do each of those things correctly, then um, we'll have a good future. But we do need to dig ourselves out of a hole. That's for okay. sure. Yeah. Uh, even before the pandemic, the numbers were not looking great in terms of mm -hmm. um, the global Aikido community um, and the interest levels and kind of, mm -hmm. it's clear that uh, we've been aging out. Not a lot of young people have been coming into the art. No. Uh, by the way, in the next few weeks on Aikido Journal, we're going to publish out uh, some of the results from a survey that we did last year. It was probably the largest survey that's ever been done in the, you know, in the Aikido community mm. since the inception of the oh, art. That, yeah, I, I recall that survey, but I don't, I didn't recall seeing results come up. Are they now finally kind of collated? And, and yeah, kind of they, they're, they're collated and, and I've, you know, we've been meaning to get to it for a while and then it just kept getting sidetracked by all these things. So I kind of right. feel bad that we haven't published it out uh, until now, but in the next couple of weeks, we'll, we'll publish that data out. Mm -hmm. uh, cool. And I, I think, what, to that. yeah. And one of the things you'll see is that the, the number of young people practicing the art has, has shrunk dramatically. Mm -hmm. Um, and we've got like a lot of, it's almost like an inverted pyramid where we have very few novice practitioners and all mm -hmm. these very senior level experienced practitioners heavy. and teachers. Yeah. You know, yeah. I remember, uh, reading an article many years ago about running a dojo and they said, one of the major red flags is having a top heavy dojo where you got a bunch of black belts and no no white belts and very few intermediates like they said that is like the kiss of death um 
and, and, and I agree. And it, it, whether you do it on an organizational or an art level scope or on a, on just a dojo level, I think it's, it, that is a problem. And my observation is big part of it is message. If a, somebody new is looking at, at an art and says, well, tell me about it. And they can't get a clear answer of what it is or what it's there to do. They're just left with, I, this was a bunch of word salad. I don't even know what what I'm signing up for, or why I should be doing it. Um, and I do think that for the people that look a little deeper and they see infighting going on between, you know, the different uh, factions or what have you, that doesn't help either. Um, but, but having a clear message about like what Aikido is and boy, if you, you know, get 10 Aikidos together and you get 12 versions of what Aikido is, <laughs> if you, when you ask them. So um, right. you know, that'll be that. And then, like you said earlier, that's a self-inflicted wound. That's not anything that the outside has to do with it. That's right. I think clarity of messaging is a big, um, is a big challenge for us and something that we can improve at yeah. in the Aikido world. And, you know, it's, it's really not that hard. Like we can, you know, we can, we can adjust our messaging and find, you don't even need to have one necessarily just one message or one position you can have a few right. as long as each one is like thoughtfully constructed and internally consistent right and compelling yep. that's great so if we can just get like one or a couple of those and then have people unify behind that i think that will go a long way yeah and, and you know i agree with you the aikido will never have no martial art will have one monolithic message that says ever everything is like this particular thing i mean even with uh, you know, any particular art, you go to one dojo, you get one type of experience and you go to another one and they're focused on a little something different. Um, as long as we can, we can have that clarity of what a particular dojo or an organization is doing. And they can say, here's the experience you're going to get. And that's going to be clear. That should reach out and grab the prospective student and say, do you relate to this? Is this something you want? Then come on in, you know, but there are other, you know, we can all openly admit there are different interpretations of Aikido and groups doing things very, very differently. Um, I've always, I've always liked the, well, let's do the Pepsi challenge, you know, let's, let's have different interpretations and we'll see in five years, you know, which one succeeded and which ones, you know, faded to obscurity. Um, yeah. And I think that, that a part of it is going the way that you talked about is I think some of it is going to fade and the ones that are vague or obscure or, uh, don't have a message, don't have anything useful or practical, I think in 10, 20 years are going to disappear. But um, I guess time will tell. Right. That's right. Um, so speaking of, of future, uh, you have a new venture going into using Aikido into teaching leadership. Is that right? Um, maybe you could describe a little of what you, what your pro that project is cooking up. Sure. So um Late last year, uh, near the end of 2019, I co-founded a new nonprofit called Budo Accelerator. Mm -hmm. And um, my co-founder, Mark Tursek, is someone who had initially started practicing Aikido, I think, 40 years ago back in Japan under Tada Sensei, mm -hmm. and uh, who's now, the, I think, the highest ranking living Aikido master. Mm -hmm. And uh, he got sidetracked by his career and you know was working like crazy for for so long and only recently in 20 i think in 2018 perhaps he he was able to make a return to to aikido a very enthusiastic return but um he has a lot of experience in the nonprofit sector and from 2009 to 2019 he was the ceo of the nature conservancy which is the world's largest environmental nonprofit okay and uh when he you know when he ended that you know, his tenure there, he was interested in doing a nonprofit um, to help inner city kids. And he was thinking, well, maybe we could do like a boxing thing or some other thing. And we were talking and, and I said, I think there's actually something better that we can do with, with Aikido to benefit, to benefit youth. And we didn't quite have like uh, a ton of clarity on exactly what it would look like. And we're still sort of, you know, in the early stages. But uh, anyway, we, we decided to co-found Budo Accelerator and the idea is to use the art of Aikido as a way to teach uh, leadership development, emotional resilience um, to high school age kids, and to help elevate lower income 
students or students from under-resourced communities through the practice of, of the martial arts. And um, that's kind of the idea. So you can think of it as, um, as a way of almost, we're using the martial art of Aikido as a way to, to kind of forge these, you know, these young people and give them uh, community, give them kind of the, you know, all the, the typical benefits that you would get from the practice of, a, of an authentic martial art, the, the physical benefits, the community benefits, all these things, but then augment them with an additional layer of um, curriculum and, and tools that, that will allow them to take what they learn and then apply it into their, into their daily lives, whether it's, you know, with their friends, with their family, academically or, or professionally as they, as they grow. Sure. You know, it's funny that uh, I'm, a, I'm also a mediator and, and negotiator. In my studies of, of the, those topics, almost every single book that I've ever read talks about using the principles of Aikido for successful negotiations, for successful, uh, successful conflict resolution and mediation. Uh, so that's another thing that I love about Aikido is that the strategies used in it don't really, aren't constrained to the physical they really are applied through all kinds of communication levels. So a program like that, I think, is, uh, is a great idea for how to bridge the concepts and principles that Aikido uses, which, in my opinion, are really just strategy. And, you know, Sun Tzu would approve of Aikido, I'm, I'm quite certain, um, because it's efficiency and it is, about, it is about that strategy, you know, efficient use of, of energy. Right. And I think you know one of the ways we're we're looking at this is is you can think of there's a whole category of education called social emotional learning, mm -hmm. and this is something that's been getting an increasing amount of traction in today's society. And if you look at, for example, Google, um, Google hires a lot of smart people, and the top seven characteristics of success at Google, zero out of seven are technical skills, mm -hmm. zero out of seven. They're all these social emotional skills. It's the ability to, um, to be able to read another person, to have empathy, um, to not be afraid to fail, right? In, 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 uh, in front of other people. The ability to be able to collaborate constructively with people who have a different position or perspective than you, or maybe people you don't like. You know, these are all the things that they're, that they're looking for for future leaders. Um, and of course, that's in the, the tech sector, but uh, almost any other area you would, you know, you'd look at, whether you're looking at people who are going to be scientists or they're going to be politicians or artists, like these are the things that are critically important for our future leaders to have, is these kinds of skills and attributes. And I personally believe that Aikido is a very powerful form of social emotional learning. However, there's like one piece that's kind of missing from the core traditional practice. And there's an organization called CASEL, like the Collaborative for Academic Social Emotional Learning, I think. And they're kind of one of the thought leaders in this space. And they aggregate a bunch of data on the social emotional learning stuff, and then they publish it out. And they basically say that, that for you to have a successful SEL curriculum, you need to focus on like four things. The It needs to be something that is active. so the student is not just reading something, but they're actively engaged in doing something. It has to be sequenced where there's like multiple activities that happen over time that are interrelated. It has to be focused where you're focusing on, you know, specific skills like empathy or whatever. And then it, it has to be explicit. You have to have like these explicit techniques to take what you learn and then apply that in the outside world. And so kind of like our theory of change is that Aikido does all those first three things really well, just the regular practice of Aikido. Like any high school student can go into, you know, any dojo that has a healthy community and build those things. But the thing that's missing are sort of like the explicit techniques and tools that teach them to unlock those skills that they've built hmm. kind of internally and then be able to apply that externally. And so what we want to do is, is over time, we want to partner with dojos around the country hopefully bring in a bunch of high school students, let them just practice Aikido, just have a traditional authentic Aikido practice in those dojos, um, and then have an additional layer of curriculum that would be mostly digital or online, but some of it could be in person, that's designed to take what they learn in those dojos and help them unlock that and apply that um, kind of to the external world. 
Mm -hmm. And we ran some programs over the summer, some leadership academies that were all online. We had students join from all around the country from some of them were Aikido practitioners uh, from lots of different Aikido organizations. Some of them had no Aikido background. Um, and the results were actually really encouraging. Like we actually measured, um, you know, measured the impact of this from a leadership perspective. And it was just, it was very encouraging to see. Very oh, encouraging. Oh, that's great. What, uh, now, how did you measure the results? What, uh, how did you, how did you do that aspect? We used a few different like measurement instruments, but but one of them um, is uh, there's a company that is that, you know they've got some research scientists on staff and um, they have pre and post program surveys mm -hmm. that are designed to measure like leadership capacity, social emotional learning, workforce readiness, all this stuff. Okay. Um, and so we we partnered with one company to um, to do pre and post measurements mm -hmm. for us and. Um, yeah, the tool was really, really great. And it gave us a lot of insight, like at the pre-test before we started the program, we got a bunch of insights on the students that allowed us to kind of um, slightly customize the focus of the curriculum based on, you know, what their strengths and weaknesses were. And then in the post, you know, you could see that there were um, huge gains in all these areas like um, collaboration, creativity, problem solving. Um, yeah, like, I mean, the gains were sort of like in the 80 to 90 90 percent wow. range yep. like almost across the board in like every dimension that was measured so um that was super encouraging to see sure well and that i think that's going to be you now we can, can talk maybe a little bit about the influence of the isolation and whatnot because the other beautiful beautiful part of the mat is you get on the mat you're working with people hands-on like that's a there's a, a level of i guess you can call it intimacy but you know there's something that you can get there that you can't get through a screen or through reading a book or through hearing something remotely. I don't think martial arts will ever be able to replace that. But I think we can certainly augment it with, you know, things that you can learn outside of your, uh, outside of your dojo off the mat that sets your mind in the right place that, so that when you go on the mat, it's ready for, for that learning. Um, and, and like I said, it's it's not just the tools, not just the physical part, but it's when the mind and the body are both developed and they meet together and then they can do their thing. So, um, you know, and we've got we've been kind of pushed into this uh, isolation world where now we're reaching out and trying to connect like we are now right here in ways that can help develop the mind and, and cultivate that readiness for when we can get face to face and get on a mat together and, and learn, um, you know, which is really a great thing. Like I, it's pretty cool. I don't know if Aikido would have ever gone this far or, or gone this direction or any martial art without sort of being nudged into it. What, what do you think? Which direction you mean? Well, the direction of, of, of using, online? using remote tools more than oh. just saying, Oh, well, if you want to learn Aikido, you got to get on the mat. Otherwise forget it. Um, yeah, I mean, there've been books and and some videos and stuff, but I think we can go a lot I mean, farther. I think so too, and I think the whole world has been you know has been pushed in 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 this way. And I think you see all these companies who who now are saying, hey, um, if you want to work from home forever, that's fine. Mm -hmm. Work from home forever, right? Or yeah. uh, a lot of these companies they're they're downsizing their you know their office footprint. Or I think the idea of traveling far distances for one meeting, mm -hmm. that's going to change where people will start to use these online tools. And so we've been forced to use these tools uh, in ways that have kind of, uh, I think, brought about a lot of innovation. And we're using them in ways to do things we've never done before. And we're also using them in suboptimal ways to do stuff that we just can't do in person. Right. And, you know, a Zoom Aikido class it's never going to replace like a physical physical contact or that right. that kind of physical practice. But I think even post pandemic, there is going to be a place for doing Zoom Aikido seminars where you can have people show up on Zoom from from all over the world, right? And and learn from an instructor, ask questions, right. feel that sense of community from people all over the place, and legitimately learn some technical stuff. Mm -hmm. So I think that 
this has been something that has pushed us to embrace new tools and figure them out. And I think I'm very proud of the Aikido community for having um, done such a good job in this area. Mm -hmm. and, and so I think that, um, yes, this will be used on a moving forward basis, um, not as much as it is now once we can get back to regular practice. Right. Yeah. yeah and I think I'm it's hopeful a that, that once that happens, we, we will be doing that. I'm actually looking at doing some collaborative seminar type work where you know, I can get a group of students in my dojo. We we have a live Zoom with with another group, maybe in England or somewhere else, and we can share knowledge with each other and then actually practice. So we get kind of the best of both worlds because, you know, prior to COVID, it's like if you wanted to learn something new, you'd have to get in a car and or in a on a plane and go travel to another seminar. You're limited by that geography. So this could start to really open things up, which is is very exciting. Um, I think it's, it could be a very cool thing. Yeah. I mean, I use it right now already in ways that I never would have thought to use before mm -hmm. where, for example, let's say that I am, um, I have a question on like a, a jujitsu thing or something like that. Mm -hmm. I can get on, I can go into my dojo and turn on my computer and there's Bruce Bookman sensei. And then Bruce, um, I have a question about this technique and I can show it on somebody mm -hmm. and then um, he can give feedback, right? Sure. Or it could be, I have a question on one of the um, like Iwama style techniques mm -hmm. and I can just, I don't want to bother Patricia Hendricks sensei all the time, mm -hmm. but like Noah Levine, one of her students, I can get him on Zoom and it, you know, he can just look at what we're doing and say, okay, well, we would do it this way, or we move our foot over here. And, mm -hmm. you know, that's the kind of like almost instant accessibility that um, it's something that maybe it was there before, but we just never really. Right. Well, and I can imagine integrated. five years of that, 10 years of that, even 15 or 20, and what Aikido is going to be when the net, that network of people, instructors and practitioners builds and is not limited by the geographical limitations or the even the limitations of uh, being able to do it only one seminar a year or, or where you you know have very limited access to people um uh, that's pretty ex pretty exciting i mean where you can kind of pick and 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 get more input on a more consistent basis and specialize to what you want to learn and that's something that always disappointed me about seminars is you know, you'd go and, and you'd hope to get something. Uh, you may or may not have been shown anything that's that's new to you or something that is, you know, different or something that you were really hoping to get. It's just sort of a shot in the dark, but a, with a, a network like this, you really could kind of get what you're, what you want, what you're ready for. And, and uh, yes, I, I just see your chat. Yes, your video does appear to be frozen. Um, okay, can, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can still hear you okay, but. Uh, okay. That's Let right. me try switching um, switching networks, and I'll see if this will improve. Okay. Um, sorry about the technical issue here, but uh, these things happen. And I think under a, I'll just keep chatting while you're while you're sorting yeah, it out. Yeah, of course. Uh, I think approaching a network of instructors and and practitioners in such a way gives us a great deal of freedom and latitude to to innovate to improve our own aikido and and share with with each other things that we find that, that just work great um and to me that's really what the what aikido the path of aikido or path of martial arts training in general is all about i agree i agree i agree and that's what keeps it fun. You're always, you know, you're learning new perspectives and, and new things. And, and even beyond technique, one of the things that's fascinated me for years, even when I, I see a technique that I've seen before, or I know it, I really like watching how a teacher teaches it because the, the teaching method is its own set of skills, all separate from the technique itself. Like what is the method that they use to convey this to somebody? Not just the important things of well, here's what you have to do to make this technique work, but like how how they roll it out, the language they use, because uh, some students will resonate with certain language and others won't. And and so it, as an instructor, you want to have a, a good library of different ways of presenting uh, a technique or, or teaching it, 
and and that's as an instructor myself i'm always fascinated with learning different methods of of how to teach a technique or how to teach a concept or principle and do it in an effective way that the student walks out and goes wow okay i now i get it i really understand um and yeah that can be that can be a whole different uh benefit um that goes hand in hand with with something like that i agree i agree so hopefully these you know these new these new communication tools will allow us to you know to do things in the future that will kind of support our ability to you know to practice to build community to build friendships um and to you know both to kind of preserve and transmit the art of aikido and maybe you know do some you know do some innovative stuff with it too mm -hmm. absolutely um well this has been a great conversation i, I really enjoyed it I, it's uh i'd like to do, in fact do another one at some point i know you're pretty busy but uh you know i know we didn't cover everything that i'd love to you know, bend your ear about um one of the things that i i would very much like to do i've been doing more interviews lately um and i understand you you train with matsuoka sensei i would love to get his his viewpoints on it i don't know if he's if he's a very private individual or might might come on but i think a lot of people would be interested to hear his experience and perspective um so if you if you wouldn't mind at least dropping the dropping the suggestion to him and and uh maybe get me connected if he's interested in it but uh but I'll thank see you him very later much. this week what's that i'll see him later this week outstanding so yeah. Uh, in my opinion, I've got a great deal of, of respect for his work and his perspective. Um, you know, he's kind of that that uh, quiet mentor uh, in the Aikido world, and and I'd be very interested to to uh, to chat with him a little bit. So, um, well, great. I really, really appreciate uh, pre appreciate you coming on. Was there anything else that you wanted to plug or to point people to? Yeah. So a few things, I I suppose. One is. Um, Aikido Journal, mm -hmm. a couple upcoming things. First, we will soon be releasing the, the community survey data. And so just a heads up for, for that, that'll just show up on our website. Those who are on our email list, um, you know, you'll, you'll get notified when that, when that shows up. And I think I would encourage everybody to, to read that, look at the data, um, just so we know, you know, kind of where, where we're at. Uh, I think it's important for the leaders in the community to you know, to, to, to have, have that perspective. And if I remember and the timing, that survey went out prior to the COVID thing. Uh, it did. So that, that would have been influ not influenced. The data would not be influenced by the lockdowns and, and whatnot. That's correct. And then uh, we do have a couple upcoming projects as well that I'm really excited about. Um, one of which is we're, we're going to see if there's enough demand for us to kind of do a return to print publishing with Aikido Journal. Okay. Aikido Journal has been digital for maybe 20 years or something like that. And Stan had, um, early in Aikido Journal's life, had done a bunch of books, um, beautiful books, well-researched books. Uh, and then eventually, you know, everything went all digital. And as a project we're gonna be doing, we'll be taking one of uh, Stanley Pranin's books that, you know, he had, had put painstaking research into and, we want to rebuild that as like a beautiful hardbound coffee table style, almost like an art book. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll see if there's enough interest and demand to do that. But the idea is that um, we're not really interested in doing print publishing just to convey or transmit information because digital is so much better than that. Mm -hmm. But if we are able to create like a beautiful physical uh, embodiment of, you know, something that can really showcase Aikido, uh, that we're proud of, um, that you can leave in your dojo or put on your library, put in your library at home or whatever. That's, you know, uh, that's something that I think we would be very interested in doing. And I think we can do a good job at it if there's enough people interested in, you know, in supporting that kind of a project. So that'll be one thing that we'll probably be, be announcing and talking about soon. We also have another uh, Aikido Journal Academy course, which will be coming out probably Q1 uh, next year. And we'll have more info on that soon, but I'm really excited about that. And it's been super fun process putting that together and, and learning a lot about that. And the only other thing I would say is uh, check out Budo Accelerator, budoaccelerator.org. This is the, 
the Aikido-based nonprofit that I mentioned. And we would just love for more people in the Aikido community to you know, get it on their radar, take a look, uh, give us any feedback that you may have. And if you'd be interested in partnering with us you know, in the future post, post lockdown, we'd love to hear from you. Sure, and I'm happy to put links in the description so uh, you can look for those. Fantastic. Well, I really appreciate your time. It's good to see you. It's been a while since we were able to chat. Excellent, Josh. It was great to have you on. And yes, it has been a while. All right. Thanks for having me on. You bet. Have a good night. You too. Thank you very much for watching and supporting this podcast. Enjoy your training.